I want to use this talk to challenge toxicologists to think about how we share data and perspectives on mechanisms even when we deem that they may not be relevant to humans. And so as we do safety evaluation and hazard identification, it's generally accepted that data we generate from preclinical models is relevant to people unless and until we prove otherwise. And in fact, there are a few examples of cases where in fact we have deemed that evidence, there is evidence for the fact that toxicities that we see in laboratory animals are not predictive of humans. And the classic example is the oil of orange or D-limonene, which has been shown to cause renal toxicity in male rats and ultimately lead to renal cancer in male rats. When we drink a glass of orange juice, we don't think about the fact that we might be be consuming something that causes cancer in a laboratory animal. But what mechanistic research did was establish that that toxicity was manifested by actions of the molecule that bound to a unique protein in, in the male rat called alpha-2 euglobulin. And with a sophisticated body of research, health authorities around the world accepted that limonene and oil of orange was a safe molecule to use in commerce as well as to consume naturally. I had the pleasure of doing a lot of work with D-limonene many years ago. And I was once giving a seminar when I was talking about the discoveries we had made. We had identified a unique metabolite of D-limonene that was binding to this protein. We identified specifically how it was binding and that it was influencing the degradation of the protein. We generated a transgenic animal and a mouse in which we overexpressed the alpha-2 euglobulin, and we showed that the mouse, otherwise resistant to this toxicity, now developed it in the presence of alpha-2 U. And we derived the X-ray crystal structure of the protein, so we actually fully understood how the molecule was actually binding in a pocket of that protein. Really cool stuff. And at the end of my seminar, Someone in the room said to me, well, if all of this isn't relevant to humans, is it relevant at all? And I thought, ooh, were they asleep? Or did I, miss, did I just miss the mark completely? But I have to tell you, it led me to think about how I actually present this kind of data when we unravel a mechanism, and again, we as toxicologists need to think about not that we're just applying our information to a risk assessment, but rather that we're actually developing fundamental new knowledge that informs basic research. So what I'd like to do is give you another story, a slightly more recent one, and, and share with you the outcome and my perspective on how we should think about some of the basic biology that would derive from the story. And the story starts with the molecule on the top of this slide, which is a guanosine nucleoside analog that is highly active against inhibiting the replication of hepatitis B. Uh, it does not work against coronavirus in these days, but very selective to hepatitis B viral replication very effective molecule. However, when we evaluated its toxicity, what we found was that it produced these really unusual findings in the mouse lung, and, and they developed very quickly, and ultimately, we found tumors in the lungs of mice actually at exposures that would be clinically relevant. So this would be a molecule that would be potentially a good pharmaceutical agent and treating a disease that could cause liver cancer, and yet we've identified a lung cancer hazard with it. So we began to try to tear apart the lesions that you see there with this lots of cells sitting in the lung. And what we found was that cells were proliferating in the lung, but there was no damage to the lung that was inciting that proliferation. That was a puzzle. We found that there were lots of macrophages accumulating in the lung, but there was no inflammatory response. There was no broad cellular increase. It was just macrophages that were accumulating in the lung. And even though that molecule inhibits DNA replication, it was not damaging DNA. So we could not explain any of these findings. 
In football, there's a pass called a Hail Mary. You haven't changed the channel, by the way. And a Hail Mary is literally an act of desperation where the team that is losing, usually at the end of the game, throws a long pass that has the lowest chance of succeeding um, in, a, in a vain attempt to either tie the score or win the game. Based on what I showed you with Antekavir, where we were was in trying to understand what was going on, we carried out what I call a hypothesis-driven Hail Mary. And what I mean by that is we looked at understanding those cellular responses and said, what could possibly be explaining this finding? And how are these cells proliferating? Why are macrophages accumulating? And so what we did was we said, understanding basic concepts of how macrophages move around in the body, we leveraged the use of a knockout mouse model that was missing a chemokine receptor called chemokine receptor 2, which is the major receptor that controls macrophage movement in the body. And so we did the obvious experiment. We dosed CCR2 null mice with entecavir, and we completed that Hail Mary pass. There was no lung lesion to be seen in these mice, no proliferation, no accumulation of macrophage. Now, I promised you I would not go into a deep mechanistic story, and I won't. But what we learned from that experiment was that the guanosine nucleoside analog in and of itself actually had chemotactic properties. It caused macrophages to move and migrate, basic biologic mechanism. Once they moved and migrated, we actually found that those macrophages were capable of driving proliferation within cell types in the lung, whereas entecavir in and of itself didn't. And the other thing we identified was that although we saw this in mice, we had no effects in rats, dogs, or monkeys, and we were able to show that entecavir bound to the chemokine receptor 2 of the mouse, but didn't interact with rat, dog, monkey, or human. And so what we had was a pretty good story to piece together that this was a finding that would not occur in humans, and in fact, we were able to successfully get this drug approved. So, it's not relevant to humans, but is it relevant at all? And here's what I want to challenge us all to think about. We identified really unexpected receptor biology in this case. If you think about it, the molecule that was inhibiting the replication of a hepatitis B virus, when we dose that to a normal healthy animal, that target isn't there. What we're looking at is an unexpected off-target effect, and in this case, it's to a chemokine receptor that we would never have identified. And in fact, what we've learned is that the chemokine receptor 2 in the mouse will actually respond to a variety of guanosine analogs. We also learned that there are really marked species differences in CCR2 biology that can control some of this. And again, although we, we know gene structure, we know protein sequence and the like, so we appreciate that there are, mark, there are species differences in this receptor. We established even further a high selectivity of binding of novel molecules that differ across species. And again, the other thing that we did was we identified that macrophages in and of themselves have a fairly substantive supporting function to maintaining cell proliferation. And in fact, our, we often think about hearing macrophage-conditioned media and other things that can actually support the proliferation of cells. We, what we found was that there are likely growth factors that are helping to cause these cells to divide and grow, and that that is causally related to tumor. And of course, we ended up with a successful risk assessment that drove to the approval of the drug. But I put that last on purpose, because what we need to think about is not just the implication of the risk assessment, but the things that we've learned in carrying out this work. 
And again, what I would challenge us as toxicologists is to make sure that we continue to emphasize the foundational nature of the research that we do to the broad scientific community, even when we say this won't happen in people. And that's fundamentally important to how we continue to advance toxicology as a science and how we engage our scientific colleagues across many disciplines. So remember, be relevant. <laughs>